Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of November 1, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why we have a lot of questions about the administration's recently released preliminary fall 2021 revenue forecast. Second, we discuss what we will be looking for in DOR's new fiscal model released Wednesday of this week. And third, we explain why, as a result of a recent federal Ninth Circuit decision, money is about to become an even bigger problem in Alaska elections. And by the way, for those of you watching this podcast on YouTube, this week, Michael and I continue to try out something new with me joining him by live video feed via Skype. As you will see when you watch, we are still working out the kinks as the video version freezes from time to time. But the audio continues, so just keep on listening when the video freezes. And now, let's join Michael. Let's take off here with number one. We've got the Department of Revenue forecasts and... uh, Oh baby, uh, there's that coming out. The governor's new plan, and of course these uh, these contribution limits. So let's start off with the DOR forecasts, which are looking rosy, but are they real? That's the question. Well, Michael, we've been talking about uh, uh, the potential for this on the on the last couple of shows, um, and uh, and the administration uh, this past week uh, came out with a preliminary fall revenue forecast. The fall revenue forecast is usually done in connection with the budget when the budget's presented in December. Uh, and usually the fall revenue forecast will come out a few days before, uh, before the budget comes out. But the administration this time has come out with a preliminary, uh, fall revenue forecast. And, uh, and, and I can see why, and, and as we've talked on previous shows, it, it's understandable why they're doing it. I mean, oil prices are up. Uh, it's it's likely to give the state a lot more revenue in the current fiscal year, uh, sets the stage for uh, more revenue in the next fiscal year, uh, and is a is a good talking point uh, as the governor continues to press for uh, continues to press for uh, a full uh, a fuller PFD. A couple of things about it, uh, well, several things about it. One is it's it's striking to me that it came out. Uh, Virtually the day before, maybe a couple of days before, but uh, the the day before, the legislative day before, the end of the special session. <laughs> you know, if you were gonna if you were gonna really want to do this, you would want to publish it at the beginning of the special session and press, you know, press for a, a, a supplemental PFD during that special session. Right. Uh, but uh, but they came out. They they come out with the fall revenue forecast at the end of the special session. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, maybe maybe longer than that, and they certainly could have come out with it uh, before now. So it's I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand the politics of coming out with it at the end of the special session. Right. Another a, a, a second thing about it, though, or, or going to the substance of it, there's there's two things that I think are important. One is uh, the revenue forecast predicts not only higher revenues this year and next year, but it predicts higher revenues through the end of the decade. Um, and I, they're doing, I think they're doing that, um, uh, in order to say, Hey, you know, we can pay a full PFD this year or a POMB 50, 50 PFD this year, we can pay another next year. And we don't need to worry about new revenues because this higher revenue 
uh, situation is going to last uh, for a number of years. We can kick the can down the road on worrying about uh, worrying about the budget as a result of this. The problem with that is they're using uh, a price deck uh, uh, for their forecast that don't that doesn't reflect the market. They've used the futures market price for the next two years, which are high. Uh, but the futures market, as we've talked about on a number of previous programs, the futures market is going down uh, uh, after the after the next couple of years. And in fact, gets down uh, into the low 60s, sort of goes back to the pre-COVID price deck uh, by the end of the decade. The administration, on the other hand, is predicting that futures prices will continue to increase and in fact reach $90 a barrel uh, by the by the end of the decade. So they use the futures market when it's advantageous to them for the next couple of years, but then, but then abandon the futures market when it starts when it starts not fitting their narrative uh, over the uh, over the longer term. And I right. think that's I think that's uh, disingenuous. I think it's a uh, it's a disservice to Alaskans to not. Uh, not be consistent in that regard. Well, I mean, it, they've they've released the uh, the revenue forecast a couple times early. It happened in 2017, and it's happened before. But, uh, you know, you're right. It is a little bit suspicious when it comes down to the last day of the special session, and then they drop this. If if this had been in place, you could have had some arguments for the last week of work in there to get something done because that has been the that's been the stumbling block, right? To all of Governor Dunleavy's proposals is that they would leave us a greater shortfall. And an increase in revenue may have submarined some of those arguments if they had really been serious about it at that point. Well, there, a lot of the argument has been around the only way you can pay a POMV 5050 uh, PFD is by taking from having an excess draw from the ERA, right? And and a lot of the opposition has been around to the POMV 5050 has been around taking that excess draw from the ERA. Well, the, the, the revenues are showing for the next couple of years, the revenues are showing you don't need to take an excess draw from the, from the, from the ERA. You're going to have uh, traditional revenues sufficient uh, to be able to pay that uh, POMB 5050. So they could have taken, if, if they would have raised, if, if they would have pursued this issue earlier, they could have cut the legs out from underneath the, the ERA argument the, that you had to take an excess draw uh, from the ERA. So it's, it's confusing. The, the delay is confusing. Uh, but it is. I mean, it it does it does set a tone for the next legislative session, for the next regular legislative session. It does set a tone uh, that I think is going to be favorable to the administration uh, for the next couple of years. But again, I think I think what they've done is sort of the political equivalent of in of in baseball hitting a solid double, uh, and uh, and you know having your runner on second base instead of doing that instead of holding the runner at second base. They waved him on. Maybe you could get a triple out of it, but they kept waving him on. And and by you know projecting uh, these price increases through the end of the decade and trying to you know kill fifteen birds with one stone by saying, not only can we do it now, we can continue to do it without new revenues. Uh, I think I think they they've stretched their credibility too far, and I think that's going to be a problem if they continue this in the in the fall revenue forecast when they publish the final one. Uh, in connection with the budget, if they continue that stretch, I think they're they're going to undermine their credibility uh, in a way that's uh, that's going to do damage to the argument. Well, and that's part of the problem again of picking and choosing, using the futures market for only this amount of time, and then moving off to something else that continues to show the rosiness of uh, of something. I mean, y- you should find one metric and stick with it for the whole time, whether it's good or bad, instead of picking and choosing only the positives. I mean, that's essentially what you're doing is they're saying that they're cherry picking uh, the the numbers to show the rosiest outcome. Instead of preparing for the worst and hoping for the best, it's preparing for the best, hoping for the best, and showing only the best, not showing the downsides. <laughs> well, it's not even the best. There, there's no basis. There's no basis in the market for that prediction of continued continued escalation in uh, in oil in oil prices, I'm I'm not aware. I mean, I'm aware of analysts who are talking about very high prices in the next couple of years. Yes, Goldman, uh, Merrill, others are talking about very high prices in the next couple of years. But I'm not aware of any analyst that's talking about continued high prices through the remainder of the decade. I mean, you can come up with theories about why that might happen. Uh, 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 about why prices might stay up, but I'm not aware of any analysts that have done that. And the market, the futures market, which is where real people put real dollars down on these things as opposed to just pontificating on them, 
The futures market is saying it's not going to happen. The futures market is saying that oil prices are going to go down. So I, there's just no basis. I mean, it, it's not it's not it's not the rosiest of the of the forecast. It's not the it's not the best of the you know the the best case out of the out of the various cases. It is a made up case, um, and and for them to for the for the administration to be using that uh, uh, to be making that prediction and to be basing arguments on that, uh, I think undercuts the undercuts their credibility in making the argument they do have a solid basis for, which is oil prices are going to be up the next couple of years. We're going to have more traditional revenues than we thought. And we're going to be able to do things that uh, that we didn't think we were going to be able to do. Right. But don't but don't count it in the long term, basically, which leads us, uh, I think, to number two. If you've exhausted number one, number I, I, I want to say I want to say one more thing sure. about about the revenue forecast. Um, and it's not as big a deal as as extending this, the price deck. But it is it is something that's going to come up and something that people ought to be thinking about. And again, it is it is sort of in the order of the administration trying to stretch a, a, a double, a solid double into a triple or, or trying for an inside the park home run. They've made a, a, a production forecast for the next couple of years. I mean, oil prices will get you about $600 million. The, the oil prices that we're seeing will get you about $600 million extra revenue uh, uh, in FY21 and about $500 million extra revenue in, uh, in uh, FY22. To get to the 1.2 billion that the, that they've talked about in additional revenue that the governor's talking about, and that you see in the ADN articles today about this issue, uh, to get to the 1.2 billion, they've spiked the production forecast. Now, right. the production forecast is so so you have bigger volumes that you're applying that bigger price to. Production forecast should be up a little bit. I mean, I track uh, uh, the 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 production forecast as closely as I track oil prices, and production has been going up. But the administration is now predicting that that the production is going to go up six percent. That's a huge number uh, uh, to to say that production is going to go up from a, from the beginning of a year, which is when the spring forecast came out, uh, to you know three months or four months later that they're coming out with this preliminary revenue forecast. A six six percent production spike is huge, um, and and to and to put some concrete numbers on it, they're predicting that the that the average production now for the current fiscal year that they're using for this revenue forecast is going to be about 490,000 barrels a day. The current average, we're four months in, we're a third of the way in, third of the year uh, in, the current average is 450,000 barrels uh, a day, uh, fully you know, 40,000 barrels uh, lower. To get to their production forecast, keep in mind that we're at 450,000 barrels a day, uh, four months in, or th- yeah, four months in. Uh, keep in uh, three months in, four months in, four months in. Keep in mind that that uh, we're we're at 450,000 barrels a third of the way, a third of the year in. Um, to get to their production forecast, you're going to have to average 505,000 barrels the rest of the year, every day, the rest of the year, average 505. A uh, thousand barrels a day. That there's no there's no basis uh, right. that you can that I that I can see for doing that. So, it the administration has a very solid double. They ought to stand on second base and go, "Hey, look at this. We've had a very solid double. We're in much better shape than we thought we were going to be. We're in much better shape to pay a supplemental PFD than anybody thought we were going to be in." But rather than do that uh, on both the long term price deck. Uh, and on the near-term production forecast, rather than do that, they've 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 tried to stretch it into a triple and try and trying to stretch it to an inside park inside the park home run. So it's problematic, and 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 I think that's what we're going to be debating and talking about uh, between now and the uh, and the regular session now until the fu- the, the the final uh, fall revenue forecast comes out. There's a lot of people that are uh, hesitant to uh, to talk about the the revenues and the forecasts and everything else. I mean, they kind of look at it, but. Uh, it seems like this happens every year. The revenue forecast comes out and everybody comes out and says, look, we're saved. And of course, then the revenue forecast turns out to be wrong. I mean, how many times has the revenue forecast turned out to really be right in the long run? You know, this is a be- this is an e- a guesstimate. This is a wag, a wild ass guess half the time. And most of the time it may be correct in the very short term, but in the long term, it's this is, you know, no. It's just not working. 
Well, at, you know, absolutely right. And and the futures mark, market is going to be wrong. I mean, it changes every day. And so if you freeze it at any given point in time, uh, sort of like the camera freezing, you want you want it to freeze at the right point as opposed to the wrong as wrong as opposed to the wrong. Point. Right. It's going to be wrong. But the question is, what what are you basing your policy on? Are you going to base it on a truly wild ass guess uh, by, you know, predicting prices that 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 there's no support for? in the market or in the, or in the analysts, or are you going to, are you going to base it on the best, the best information you have at the time? And the best information we have at the time at any given point in time is the futures market, because again, that's where people with money are, 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 are putting their money uh, down on, on expectations of where prices are going to go. And the, and the futures market's been in, you know, what analysts call backwardation, which is where the price is dropping over time. Futures market has been in backwardation since OPEC took control of the market uh, uh, back uh, back earlier this year, um, and and it's and it's remained in backwardation this entire period of time. You know there there could be things to change it. I mean if if shale comes back on in the U.S. and we take control and that takes control of the market back from OPEC, uh, it's possible the market uh, the market dynamics change. But at any given point in time, you know, you've got you've got what what people with money are telling you is 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 going to be the the price deck out there. Why do you why do you just you know go to some fantasy land uh, that's not supported not supported by the market? I mean, that's that's not we talk talk about ourselves being fiscal conservatives. That's not the fiscal conservative way to budget to just you know throw darts on the board out there and say, Oh, it's going to be higher. It's going to be higher. It's going to be higher. Right. Yeah. The fiscally conservative way is to use the best information you got at the time. And I, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I mean, we saw the same thing. Somebody mentioned it in the chat room earlier. Is this the same thing? Didn't we go through this back when Parnell was governor? And I remember him, right. I remember him writing budgets based on a premise of $117 a barrel oil when oil was riding at 71 or $72 or something and acting like that was how everything was going to be uh, based on his revenue projections of, you know, this $117 a barrel oil, which it was nowhere. It was not going. It was not going north of uh, of eighty dollars a barrel at that point, but that's kind of where we sit. That's you know instead of basing it on on you know where we're, we're this is why one of the, the 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 one that we don't really talk about on the charter of changes is the change the funding mechanism, where we should instead be basing the funding and the spending on the state of Alaska on a rolling average of what we received over the last five years instead of. Oh, we're going to throw a dart at the dartboard as what the future markets hold, and that's what we're going to plan on spending. I mean, it, it just to me, it makes no sense. Yeah, and Bill Walker did the same thing. I mean, I recall during the Walker administration, uh, you and I talked about it on the show at the time. During the Walker administration, they they plotted a very uh, uh, pessimistic uh, future of production levels that the production levels were going to go down and down and down. Um, and and in fact, in response to SB twenty one and other things production levels have held fairly steady. So right. it's not just this administration, but but it's others too. Yeah, others, others as well. Too. Moving on to number two of the weekly top three, which is the governor's new uh, spending plan, the new revenue plan. He's supposed to come out with it tomorrow, apparently. This is in conjunction with the new DOR forecast we just got finished talking about. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest uh, commentating on all things fiscal in the weekly top three. Brad, number two. So the, uh, the 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 governor has, or the Department of Revenue Commissioner Lucinda Mahoney has 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 said let, said last week that the new fiscal plan model, the administration's fiscal plan model, uh, is going to come out uh, tomorrow, uh, November third, uh, and will be available to the public. And the fiscal plan model uh, is designed, um, as as it's been described thus far, is designed to enable Alaskans, all Alaskans to go in and look at various revenue options uh, and the impact and chart the impact of various revenue options, uh, uh, what the impact of various revenue options would have on Alaska's fiscal situation. It uses a, a, a design of spending levels. It uses a design of, of certain oil prices. You can change the oil prices. Um, it's not, the, 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 the model is not really, <clears throat> this model is new. But the idea of a model is not new. We had one at the beginning of the Walker administration. Uh, some may recall that the Walker administration had a, a big meeting up in Fairbanks at the University of Alaska Fairbanks after uh, the governor was elected, uh, designed to address uh, the fiscal situation 
Uh, and he rolled out, uh, the Walker administration rolled out at that time, a model that did uh, many of the same things. Uh, a few things about, about the model. I mean, I, I haven't seen it yet, so I'm going to be looking at it at the same time that everybody else is uh, when it comes out tomorrow. Uh, but a couple of things about it. One, the same way as the revenue forecast, why is this coming out the day after uh, the special session, the fourth special session uh, uh, expires? Uh, Revenue Commissioner Mahoney first started talking about it back in August uh, before the before the start of the third special session and said it was going to be rolled out. She gave testimony on a Thursday, I think, in front of the working group and said it was going to be rolled out in the next week uh, uh, for Alaskans to look at before the start of the of the third special session. Um, and it never came out. Uh, and you look on the DOR's website during the, the past couple, few months. And it's been uh, the fiscal model has been saying coming soon. Now they're going to roll it out after the end of the fourth special session. Uh, and it's just, I mean, that's just a, it, it's like the revenue forecast. Why, why are they doing the timing that way? It's almost like they didn't want the, didn't want the legislature to, and Alaskans to have it during the course of the special session. The second thing about it, Michael, um, is, is the, the thing we're going to be looking for is whether it has a tool in there to see to, to, to analyze who pays the distributional analysis aspect uh, of, of any uh, any revenue option. So for example, we know from the analysis that both ICER and ITEP did in the in 2016 and 2017 that that the people that pay the people that bear the burden of PFD cuts are middle and lower income Alaska families. We know that that largely shoves the burden as, as a share of income off on middle and lower income Alaska families. We know sales taxes uh, uh, shove the burden uh, uh, to a to a certain degree, not as much as PFD cuts, but we know sales taxes uh, shove the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families. So the question that what, what I'm gonna be looking for when, when the model rolls out is, is there a tool in the model uh, uh, that enables you to tell who is going to pay the revenue burden? Who's going to pay the burden of the various uh, uh, proposals that uh, that are available to be to be looked at uh, in the revenue model? If they don't tell you who pays under these under the various revenue uh, burdens or the rev various revenue options, it's only half a model. I mean, the the thing that we've talked about on the show before, the thing that I've complained about uh, in terms of the presentations before the. Uh, House Finance Committee and the and the House Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee is all they've focused on is how much government gets out of each of these uh, out of each of the various uh, proposals you know, out of each of the PFD proposals and out, out of each of the the various other uh, revenue proposals they haven't focused on the impact on the overall uh, on on Alaskans uh, who pays and they haven't focused on the economic impact what the economic what the impact is on the overall Alaska Alaska economy of these various proposals I, I hope the administration's the the DOR's uh, tool that rolls out tomorrow is going to enable Alaskans to look at the impact both on Alaska uh, families and look at the impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, uh, and and it will be great uh, if it does uh, I'm not that hopeful given what they've said about it to this point but that I think is going to be the uh, that I think is going to be the key uh, of, uh, of of what the revenue model does tomorrow well, and uh, and again, I we look at a lot of this, and I said it, I said it before. Uh, you know, they always seem to come up with these these different plans that fit their scenarios. Um, uh, you know, regardless of who the governor is or who's in charge, and it always seems to paint the ra the rosiest scenario in the long run. But you're right; I think we've got to know who ends up paying, and that's one thing that has been missing from all the different discussions. I mean, ICER talked about it in in their pres various presentations over the years. I don't know if they covered that this year uh, when they were uh, in there talking about it, but it seems like uh, it's one thing that's getting lost. Is sure all these levers can be pulled, but what's the effect on the Alaska economy in the long? Long run, and they seem to keep forgetting that. Yeah, exactly right. And to know the impact on the Alaska economy, you've got to know the impact on Alaska families. You got to know who's paying because, because you know, middle and lower income Alaska families really drive at least the consumer portion of the economy. Uh, they're the ones who who you know spend all of their paychecks or right. nearly all of their paychecks. Uh, and so you've got to know what you know who the money whose pocket 
the money is uh, is being uh, is being taken care out of to to do the economic impact. It would it will be great if if this fiscal model not only tells you how much government gets, uh, but also tells you you know it, it, to the extent there is a draw on Alaska families, which Alaska families are paying it, and through that uh, the the effect on the overall Alaska economy. It will be great if it does that. I'm not optimistic it's going to, but uh, it will be great if uh, if the administration is doing. This leads us down. we got about five minutes here, and I want to get into number three because this is a big one uh, that I think a lot of people haven't paid uh, that close attention to, and that is the decision here by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals not to take up the appeal on the state's election uh, contribution system that was set uh, by a 2006 ballot initiative with restrictions on how much money people could give. And it essentially opens up the floodgate to contributions from around the world, around anywhere, to uh, to almost unlimited contributions to candidates, causes, PACs, and so on. Uh, hit me with this, and then you can wrap your whole ConCon thought up into that as well. <laughs> well... We we talked on 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 shows earlier this year about uh, uh, when we were talking about the we are un, unrepresented uh, 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 video that was going to play and you had uh, guests on that talked about campaign finance issues and that was really focused at the federal level and the problem with money in poli- politics at the federal le- uh, level. Justin Amash. Uh, uh, was uh, was featured uh, as as one of those who said, you know, what's really the part of the big problem uh, with uh, 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 politics in the in the nation is is the is the influence that money has on it. And talking about that at the federal level, we've sort of been sort of been uh, a little bit isolated from that in Alaska because we had fairly strict uh, uh, campaign finance limits on uh, uh, contributions to individual candidates. Uh, we have we have problems with ballot measures uh, and and other things as we as we experienced in the last election cycle, but candidates we've been fairly fortunate because we haven't had a lot of money. We've had fairly good uh, campaign limits on uh, on candidates, so it's been it's been the candidates having to sell themselves as opposed to money selling the candidates uh, in, in election in Alaska elections. What's happened is the Ninth Circuit uh, has voided uh, those uh, those those limits. They voided them across the board. Not only have they voided them in terms of in terms of dollars that Alaskans can contribute to Alaska candidates, but they've voided the limits on uh, on on uh, dollars coming in from the outside. Uh, I think there I think there are still limits on international contributions uh, beyond the United States, but but there are no longer contributions on on what uh, on what outside groups uh, can spend in support of uh, in support of candidates or or give uh, give to candidates uh, directly. So it's so we we've now entered a whole new era, I think. With with the elimination of these limits, we've entered a, a whole different era uh, in terms of Alaska politics, uh, where money is going to play uh, a, a huge role uh, in in defining candidates. And we've seen in the last election cycle, we've seen that Alaska is very susceptible to money. Um, you know, the the money that came in behind ballot measure two, behind the the ranked choice voting, uh, the jungle primary and ranked choice voting, the money that came in behind that was determinative. Uh, in getting that ballot to ballot measure passed, um, and and so we've seen the influence money has. I, it, we, we saw it in ballot measure one, the the oil money, the came, the outside oil money that came in, right, in connection with that ballot measure. So we've seen the influence that money has uh, in Alaska politics, and and the elimination of these limits. Uh, I am I am very concerned uh, is going to result in a, in an entirely different set of dynamics. Uh, in our political races uh, going forward than what we've had in the past. Well, yeah, especially when you add uh, jungle primary, ranked choice voting, and redistricting on top of all that, and then unlimited money. Oh, baby, 2022 is going to be a train wreck. Uh, and and you, you've said it very well. Alaska's a cheap date. You can get you can get a lot of mileage out of out of political spending up here because of our uh, our, our limited market, our, our, our small market, uh, and the small number of people. So it's... Uh, Alaska is a cheap date, and and you know we have two United States senators uh, in, in a in a Senate that's that's critically divided or or closely divided. We have two United States senators, and the national parties are going to pour a huge amount of money, and people who want to influence are going to pour a huge amount of money in uh, chasing 
chasing the influence. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the same, of course, thing applies to the Constitutional Convention idea. Lots of outside money pouring in to convince Alaskans that this way is the right way if they rewrite the Constitution, if they, you know, put the PFD in but say it'll only be passed if we change a bunch of other stuff. I mean, it's very dangerous, and, and that's where my concern lies. That's exactly what I'm talking about with the unlimited amount of money that can be poured into it. And, and again, media costs in Alaska are cheap compared to any, you know, any other real larger state and they feel like they can make these changes in the smaller states by expending you know large amounts of money these popula low population states with low costs of media exposure they can drop a couple three four million dollars and be like yeah we can turn this state purple or blue and it'll be fine and and we can get the we can you know they can do it one at a time and i think that's the new i think that's the new game plan and the new mantra it seems like it, it is, Michael. And, and you know, people say, well, Alaska, who really cares? I mean, uh, some people argue Alaska, they're not going to spend money here. I mean, who really cares about what Alaska does? We have two United States senators. Uh, uh, we have, we have you know, uh, as much influence in the United States Senate as, uh, as New York does or as California does or as Michigan or as Florida, Texas, any of the large states. We have as much influence. People will, will spend money. Uh, to come in here and try to influence the outcome of the uh, of of the of, of the uh, uh, Senate election, and and we've seen in the municipal elections, in the Zalatel recall election, we've seen in the in the in the state elections with the with the ballot measure, we've seen that people will come in and spend money trying to you know tell Alaskans uh, uh, how we, how we ought to vote as opposed to right. Alaskans deciding it's outside right. money coming and telling us. How yeah. To I mean, the Zalatel recall generated $250,000 in contributions. Now on the one side, most of that was in state, but on the other side, there was a union that threw money at it and everything else. But that's just a recall election. When you've got an assembly seat generating a quarter of a million dollars on a recall and they have now opened up the bar and opened up the door to unlimited contributions, Good Lord. I mean, you want to see how many, how much dollars are going to be thrown around. And like you said, they may think, well, what Alaska, who cares? But if it's part of a larger plan where they're taking these smaller states a piece at a time and turning them purple or turning them blue, and don't think that Alaska couldn't ha have a blue component. Look at all the, look at all the assemblies that are going on around the state at Fairbanks, Sildotna, you know, the, the, the Kenai Peninsula, the Anchorage assembly, uh, you know, and now even the Matsu is being threatened with some, there's more liberal thought being pushed out there on the Matsu assembly. I mean, th there's some serious issues going on here. And if they turn the whole thing blue, that's my, that's my fear that maybe they put a PFD component into a constitutional convention, but they tie it to a bunch of other stuff, you know, social welfare programs or, uh, you know, I don't know, critical race, the, the gender equality. I mean, they tie a bunch of other stuff into it and they say, well, see, if you want your PFD, you got to vote for this. And people will be like, well, OK, that sounds reasonable to me because they haven't thought out the long term consequences of it. And the next thing you know, we've we've changed the Constitution fundamentally. And, you know, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater at that point. Yeah, it's uh, uh, it, 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 we're in a we're in a very uh, very new environment. We don't know where it's going to go, uh, but people with money uh, uh, are are going to are going to come in here. Uh, given the given the elimination of the of the finance limits, people with money are going to come in here and try to influence the, the the outcome of the election. And we've seen now. I'm just going to go back to it every time that this comes up. We've seen with ballot measure two, it works. That, that, that pouring a bunch of money into Alaska, into Alaska media, uh, behind uh, glitzy campaigns, uh, behind glitzy uh, uh, websites and, and, and a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, media, uh, both social media as well as uh, print and, uh, and electronic media, uh, we've seen it works. We've seen it can move the Alaska electorate. So right. um, <laughs> there will be... Uh, a big push uh, to try to to try to influence the outcome. I, we, the, the 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 Ninth Circuit outlawed the limits we had. It didn't outlaw any limits whatsoever. Uh, and and while I doubt that uh, we see it in the in in this coming in this coming regular session because uh, because there's a lot of other things to do, um, uh, and and people with money will or or people will be looking for campaign contributions. Um, I hope at some point 
we 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 as Alaskans come back and say we need to reconsider what we've right. done in terms of opening the floodgates. Absolutely, Jim in the chat room says we're one governor away from being a hard blue state. I will remind people that Alaska was once a very blue state, and that we've changed, and the nature of these things is very cyclic. And if we if we allow those changes to continue, we could go from being I mean we're red to soft purple right now. We could be we could be purple to blue. Uh, or full on blue within just a couple cycles. I mean, if if this thing goes through, and we don't really pay attention to that, money makes a difference. People are swayed. Not everybody is listening to the Michael Duke show and is all up on all the details of all the things. They're busy living their lives and taking their kids and doing all the other things, and they just go to the ballot. They look, they go, oh, okay, and they pull the lever. They they're not always informed, and it's still their right to do so. It doesn't make it okay, but I mean it. it they are swayed by money. There is no two ways about it. In your talking points that you sent me for your top three today, or your your titles, I guess, for your top three, um, you didn't mention this uh, Constitutional Convention, but it's really starting to get more and more buzz. Um, are you as worried as I am over something like this? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You, you have it right, Michael, with the charter of changes, uh, and, and one of them being to change the players. That's where we ought to focus. Uh, uh, in in getting the players right. The Constitutional Convention is just like a crapshoot. And you're exactly right, and I'll talk about it when we get to that segment. We're, we're going to be flooded with money. I mean, the National Democrat Party seeing an opportunity to 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 take control of Alaska, uh, they're going to they're going to put a lot of money in here. And it's just um, just uh, it, it it's, it's more than scary. I mean, you can you can sort of see this train coming. Um, so I think I think we ought to be focused on the charter of changes that you've outlined and, right. and change the players to get a better result, not change the Constitution. Yeah. Chuck says, I think that people are just sick to death of a legislature that can't and won't function at all. It makes radical things look very good. And I agree with you. I agree with Chuck 100 percent. People are so frustrated with the lack of movement in the legislature and the lack of willingness, political will, whatever you want to call it, that all of a sudden radical measures do look tempting because it seems to be the only solution that's possible out there at, at, at this point. Yeah. Uh, revolutions or radical measures never go the way you, you anticipate for those who study history. You can just look at the French revolution and see how many cycles that kicked off. Uh, I'm not, we don't know where a constitutional convention would take us. But we do know it would bring in a flood of money. And, uh, and we saw, I mean, we saw in the last uh, ballot measures, we saw, a flood of oil money defeat uh, ballot measure one. We saw a flood of, of outside money, uh, do gooder money, uh, uh, pass uh, uh, ballot measure two. Right. Um, and million, so we, we know what money will do. So right. I, yeah, th those those who think this is a, a panacea, I think, are just uh, they're just not thinking through the issue. Yeah, I'm I'm just I'm very concerned about that, especially the millions of dollars that poured in on ballot prop two, with all the confusing wordage and I mean using ads that say we want to get dark money out of politics while using dark money to fund the ad campaign to tell you that they want to get dark money out of politics, is the height of irony and and people just didn't get it and and the average Alaskan is not they're not wonks or talking heads like we are where we're down into this stuff every day, and they just go oh. Oh, yeah, they mm, that makes sense. And then they vote for it. Uh, and I'm not criticizing them. I'm just saying they don't they're not taking the time to dive into it like many of us are. And they will be swayed by the millions of dollars of incessant advertising that will come out of that. I guarantee it. So, yeah. Final thought here, Brad, about uh, 60 seconds. Well, Michael, it's going to be an interesting uh, uh, session. I think the the fiscal issues are going to are going to dominate. Uh, the governor's trying to take control of that with uh, with the new revenue forecast, uh, and I think there's some very good things in that revenue forecast. We just need to be concerned uh, about not trying to stretch a solid double. We need to stand on second base. We need to take the double we've got uh, and not undermine the credibility by trying to stretch it into a triple or an inside park home run and. Uh, and and hopefully the government governor will uh, the administration will take uh, take that to heart and, uh, and and take their take their double and stand on second base and uh, and make progress as a result of that. Well, we can always hope. Uh, again, prepare for the worst, hope for the best. That's all we can do at this point is hope for the best. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, my friend. Thank you so much for coming on board today. Michael, as always, uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining us on this. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. 
Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top Two.